Hello friends, welcome to The Buzz. On this episode, we're gonna fill your head with so many fun facts, you'll be dying to share it with your family and friends. First, we're gonna be busting some common nature myths that we've all grown up hearing. Then we'll explore wildlife coloration and see how every spot, stripe, and color is intentional. Get ready to see the wildlife kingdom in a whole new light on this episode of The Buzz. Growing up, we hear many tales about wildlife and nature in general. These usually are here to help us learn a lesson or keep us safe. Things like touching a toad will give you warts, or on full moon, people tend to act strangely. Well, we've done our research and we're gonna be busting some of those common myths. Reptiles and amphibians tend to get a lot of myths. And that's probably because many people think they're probably the least cutest and cuddliest animals of the animal kingdom. But like, come on, I have to say that must be a myth in itself because snakes are so cute. But I digress. Coming from someone who loves to cuddle snakes, I can confidently tell you that snakes are not slimy. Snakes are cool and dry to the touch due to their scales. Snakes like our corn snake here have very smooth scales while other snakes like garter snakes or northern water snakes have keels on their scales that make them a little bumpy. I think this myth originates from the confusion of amphibians versus reptiles. Reptiles have scales and tend to live in drier places, where amphibians, like my salamander friend here, have smooth skin and live in wetter places. Amphibians like salamanders and frogs can secrete slimy ooze on their skin to help them breathe and also protect them from diseases and predators. This one I can also speak personally to because I have caught many of toads and frogs with students and even here on the buzz. And no, I did not get any warts. However, it's probably more common that if you pick up a frog or toad, it will pee on you, which has happened to me. But this is a great defense for the animal because it will help encourage the predator to drop or spit it out. The wart myth is thought to have originated because warts are contagious and a toad's skin looks awfully bumpy and warty. But this isn't true. They can't pass from an animal to a human. In humans, they're caused by a human papilloma virus and it can only be passed to human to human. Animals also get this, but it can only be passed within the species. So dog to dog, frog to frog, and so forth. This myth is used to encourage children from not touching reptiles and amphibians, which is probably a good rule of thumb. However, I know the thrill that it can be to catch a frog that's hopping in your yard. So if you wanna get a little wild, go ahead and catch that frog, but make sure your hands are free from lotion, sunscreen, and bug spray. Any chemicals on your skin can easily transfer to their skin. When you're done, make sure you let it go and wash your hands to protect you from its bacteria. wrong with this statement. First off, poisonous and venomous do not mean the same thing. They get confused with each other very often. So poisonous means it can be dangerous if you ingest it, or like licking a frog, for example. However, venomous means it's injected through something like fangs. So spiders are actually venomous because they inject their toxins using their fangs. Secondly, daddy long legs aren't actually spiders. They're called harvestmen, and it's because they have different body parts. So harvestmen only have one body segment versus spiders having two. They also are known to have only two eyes versus the normal eight eyes we see in other spiders. Lastly, the term daddy long legs is a common name that can get used for different species. 
So like the ones we see in our forest, those are harvestmen. We also see daddy long legs being used for cellar spiders. And lastly, even crane flies get confused. The crane flies are those that look like giant mosquitoes, but they can't be part of this myth because they don't have mouth parts to bite. The harvest men have more grabbing mouth parts to tear apart their prey versus bite them with venom. So that leaves cellar spiders. And research has found out they do have venom, but it's not strong enough to affect humans. So long story short, this myth is just not true. This would probably be the case for other baby animals besides birds, but in any case, it's not true. Birds in general have a poor sense of smell, so they recognize their young by sight and sound. Same goes for eggs, and they will rebuild a nest if a predator comes and disturbs or destroys the eggs, but a human touch is just not strong enough to make that reaction. That being said, that does not give us the green light to go rescue abandoned wildlife. Truth is, these birds are probably not abandoned. If you see a nestling, which is a little bear bird that has clearly fell out of a nest, the mother can pick it up and bring it back. If you see it, you can look nearby shrubs and trees for the nest and plop it back in. The other option that we see a lot is a fledgling. And fledglings are like the ugly ducklings. They're just growing in their feathers and they look a little awkward. And these birds tend to be found on the ground most often because they're learning how to fly. If you see one, give it space and walk away. The parents are nearby and they're waiting for you, the scary human, to move away before coming to help the bird. This is a big one. Ask any nurse, police officer, or even a school teacher, and they'll report unusual behavior or even more rambunctious behavior on the days with full moons. And our followers on social media have a few things to say about this as well. Many studies have been conducted to find that link, but results have been murky at best. When doing research, it can be hard to account for all the variables involved. So for an instance, they did a study of car accidents on full moon nights. Problem is, they only looked at full moons on the weekends, and accident rates are higher on weekends anyway. Other studies have focused on the gravitational pull that the moon has with water bodies. If our bodies have 80% of water, wouldn't we be affected too? Well, the moon does help control the tides in the oceans and maybe a few lakes, but it does not have any effect over closed bodies of water, which includes us, so we are not affected. So if science isn't backing this theory, where is all this coming from? Well, movies usually use a full moon to set a spooky scene. I am sure all of us can tell when a werewolf is supposed to change. There's also something called illusory correlation, which is the perception of a reality that doesn't exist. So this means when we have a full moon, we tend to remember events and link them together. If we had some unusual behavior not on a full moon, we might not remember it as clearly. Lastly, it is possible that the full moon could have affected human behavior back when humans didn't have electricity and we slept underneath the stars. If you can picture having a full moon would be really bright at night and would probably affect your sleep patterns. If you don't get enough sleep, you probably were gonna have a little unusual behavior the next day. We have just scratched the surface on these nature myths. There are so many more that exist that just aren't true. Like moss growing only on the north side of trees? Not quite, moss can grow in many places. Or have you heard of the phrase blind as a bat? Well, actually, some bats have better eyesight than humans. But these myths spark curiosity. So I challenge you, the next time you hear of a nature myth, do your research and see if you can bust it.
The benefits are great when you invest in nature by donating to the Nature Foundation of Will County. You can help protect our precious habitats and restore natural areas back to their native state. Provide educational opportunities to unlock the natural world for present and future generations. Support diversity and inclusion so everyone can experience the magnificence of nature. The Nature Foundation works hand in hand with the Forest Preserve District of Will County to strengthen the commitment to land stewardship, nature education, wellness, cooperation, and sustainability. Donations large and small make a lasting and significant positive impact on the environment. Invest in nature and join our growing community. Support the cause at willcountynature.org. Make this be the year that you take it outside and experience nature at its best in Will County's forest preserves. Create lasting memories close to home. Embrace healthy outdoor habits or discover new opportunities for you and your family to spend some quality time together. Find those peaceful moments. Gain a greater appreciation for wildlife and the critical role all creatures play in the ecosystem. Explore a preserve or trail that may be new to you. The views might just surprise and inspire. Seek out more ways to take it outside at reconnectwithnature.org. March is prime time for migration. A few of the early birds that either arrive or just pass through include red-winged blackbirds, sandhill cranes, even pelicans. And one of my favorite of the bunch are turkey vultures. When I see these guys soaring in the sky, I know spring is on its way. And they have fascinating, maybe even a little unusual adaptations to do what they do best, work as nature's cleanup crew. First off, let's talk about how to spot one from up high. These are large raptors, standing two feet tall with a six foot wingspan. When they're flying, they hold their wings in a V position rather than extending it straight out like a hawk's. They also tend to teeter back and forth when soaring. And sometimes you'll see a handful of vultures circling up in the sky. When you see this behavior, chances are they found a meal. Birds aren't usually known for having a great sense of smell, but turkey vultures are an exception. They can smell their food from more than a mile away. And they're not smelling bird seed. Instead, they prefer carrion, which is the flesh from dead animals. Mm. Their red heads are bald, to make sure that any dead meat or goo don't stick at any feathers. Picture the vulture going into a carcass and kind of digging out some meat. It's really for cleanliness. If you see one feasting on a meal, make sure to keep your distance. Turkey vultures have a marvelous defense mechanism. If you or a predator gets too close, they'll vomit. And to note, they have excellent range, being able to hurl their stomach contents 10 feet. And if you think that was charming, they also have a special way to deal with heat. They like to sun themselves with their wings extended wide. This pose is to help them warm up, but to also bake off any lingering bacteria that may have gotten on them while digging through a carcass. Now, 
sometimes they can get too hot. And in this case, they do something called urohydrosis, which means they urinate down their legs to cool off. It's also thought that their high acidity in their urine also takes care of leftover bacteria. Why should we care about turkey vultures? Well, imagine all the dead, incredibly smelly things that would be laying around if they weren't here to chow down on them. They help the environment by cleaning up the animals before they rot and carry diseases. So next time you see one teetering up high, make sure you say thank you to nature's hardworking janitors. If you're looking to do a little spring cleaning and have unused bikes taking up space in your garage or shed, cruise on over to one of two Recycle Your Bicycle collection sites. Bikes of all ages and conditions are accepted. Working Bikes is a nonprofit charity that picks up the donations and makes any necessary repairs to get the bikes back on the road. The refurbished bikes are distributed both locally and globally for people who need low-cost transportation. Since this program began in 2011, we've collected nearly 1,400 bikes. Join the effort to help working bikes get more people moving. For more details on this charitable program, visit reconnectwithnature.org. Nature is very purposeful, and the colorful animal kingdom is no exception. Our wildlife display an array of colors, from browns to greens to bright oranges and red. And these aren't for fashion, they're vital for survival. Animals may be hiding using camouflage, or they might be sending out warning signals with bright colors, or maybe they're mimicking something else to avoid detection. I think one of the most famous coloration adaptations is camouflage. Both predators and prey use camouflage or cryptic coloration to blend in and avoid detection. And there's a few ways to do this. There is concealing camouflage, counter shading, and destructive camouflage. An adult white-tailed deer has reddish-brown fur that is considered concealing camouflage. That one color blends into its habitat, like tree bark, shrubs, and tall grasses. This method is also very common in Arctic animals, like polar bears, Arctic hares, and snowy owls, who are all white against their snowy habitats. Counter shading is when an animal's back and stomachs are different colors. So picture a gray squirrel with a darker gray back and a lighter, whiter tummy. It helps for the squirrel because from above, if a hawk's looking down, that dark gray blends in with the tree branches and the mottled ground. But if a coyote is scoping out from below, that white stomach blends in with the lighter sky. Disruptive camouflage uses spots and stripes, patterns, and so forth to break up the animal's outline. This provides misleading information on its size and shape. A young deer, like a fawn, has white spots on a brown background, and this is to help the deer blend into the forest floor. Those white spots are like sunlight peeking in and speckling on the ground. Animals like owls and moths have modeled patterns of blacks and browns and tans to blend perfectly in with tree bark. and one animal even takes it further. The gray tree frog has a splotchy pattern that looks like lichen on tree barks and branches, and they can change their color depending on the environment. They can go from brown to gray to green. 
Some animals don't need to hide. Aposematic coloration is bright, bold, solid colors, or maybe they're in patterns, and they are communicating a warning signal. These bright colors are saying that the animal may be poisonous, venomous, or even just taste bad. Studies have shown that it only takes a predator just one encounter to learn to avoid these toxic animals. This warning coloration often appears in insects, spiders, and frogs. But my favorite example is our skunk. Though on first looks, you wouldn't think that black and white are really bright colors, but this white contrast of the black makes a bold pattern and it's trying to tell you, don't mess with me because I'll spray. Another popular example is our monarch butterflies. In the caterpillar stage, monarchs eat milkweed, which makes them toxic whether they're a caterpillar or a butterfly. So the stripes on that caterpillar, along with those bright orange, black, and white stripes on the butterfly, are trying to tell you, don't eat me, I'm poisonous. Some animals may be camouflaged and have bright colors. Sexual dimorphism is the difference between males and females within the same species. This is most popular in birds, but it does occur in other animals. The classic example of this is our state bird, Northern Cardinals. Males are bright red, where females are a duller tan with just a few highlights of red. Mallard ducks come to mind as well. Think of the males with the shiny green heads and the females modeled in browns and tans. These bold males are communicating, hey, notice me. They may be trying to catch a date with a female or be distracting, luring a predator away from the nest. Meanwhile, the female is more suited to stay hidden and protect the nest by camouflaging it. Another strategy is called mimicry, where an animal will look smell, sound, even behave like another animal or a different object to get a benefit in return. This happens a lot in insects, but can happen in other animals. And there's a lot of different types of mimicry depending on what's being mimicked. Also, they can be using camouflage or those bright colors of a posematic coloration. I think the most well-known type of mimicry is Batesian mimicry. This is when a harmless animal is looking like a dangerous animal. To have venom or poison or even stingers takes a lot of energy for that animal to produce. So these animals are getting all the advantages of looking dangerous without the energy costs. There are a few species of flies that take advantage of this by looking like more dangerous bees. There's a transverse flower fly I've seen in our own preserves that look like a honeybee or maybe a wasp. And there's robber flies that look like big fuzzy bumblebees. How you can tell the difference though is look at their eyes. Flies have those giant eyes and you can't mistake that for a bee. Mullerian mimicry is when both animals are actually harmful and they look like each other. This is a benefit because if a predator encounters one, chances are it won't counter either species. Think of the monarch butterfly and the viceroy butterfly. Both are poisonous and both look similar, but they're not actually genetically related in any way. The monarch butterfly gets its poison from the milkweed and viceroy's gets its poison from willows. Some animals mimic non-living things. This is called mimesis. And think of a walking stick insect. So it's already got this long twig body and it can actually sway with the wind. And if a predator comes poking around, it can tense up its body so it feels as hard as its twigs. Another example is our comma and question mark butterflies. When they close their wings, they look just like the dead leaves on the ground. and don't let this name fool you, the beautiful wood nymph moth is mimicking bird poop. On a rare occasion, you may see an animal expressing atypical colors due to a genetic anomaly. Over the years, we've seen an all-white great horned owl, a white red-tailed hawk, even a few white deer. 
Albinism is a recessive gene passed down by both parents, and it doesn't express in every generation. So those parents could be looking like the typical coloration that that species should look like. Albinism is a lack of pigment and will show all white feathers or fur. Their eyes will also have a reddish pinkish coloration. Leucism is similar with the partial expression of pigmentation. This means the eyes, beaks, and feet will show the typical colors of the animal, but there'll still be blotches of white throughout. On the flip side, we have seen all black squirrels when typically they should be gray and white. This is melism, which is an expression of excess pigmentation. In these cases, coloration could be more of a hindrance than a help. When the animal is supposed to be relying on camouflage to stay hidden, being all bright white may give the predators an upper hand. Next time you hit the preserves, see if you can find a hiding animal using camouflage. Or maybe one that's saying, keep your distance using bright colors. Or maybe you'll be lucky to spot something mimicking something else trying to fool predators. I challenge you to find all these colorful adaptations. I hope we've filled your brain with so much knowledge you are bursting to tell the first person you see. Can you ask them to point out some camouflaged animals or maybe those with super bright colors? Or ask them what their stance is on a full moon. Map your next adventure at reconnectwithnature.org to find more wildlife fun facts and see an upcoming full moon program. I hope to see you busting even more myths, but until then, I'll see you next time on The Buzz.